I'm intrigued to know what you're eating. Uh, <laughs> I think that's going to be the spring. Sorry, that's my breakfast. <laughs> really hungry. You... Oh, oh, look at that. That's what we that's want. Pretty, breakfast. Uh, Pretty good looking breakfast. Uh, anyway, welcome everyone to our weekly webinar. So we're underway now, and um, it was just nice to have a little bit of breakfast uh, intro there. Um, so this is the our CMOT CMOOC webinar, and we're into week three. So we're uh, steaming along into our seven weeks, and uh, with me today, uh, all the way from the UK, we have uh, Ian, Ian Upton Hello. from Coventry, Coventry University. And uh, it's great to have Ian here. It's currently 9.35 p.m. Yep, in the evening. UK. So uh, great to have you on board. And Kavita. Hello. And uh, Kavita, you're, what, Sydney? Melbourne. Melbourne, Melbourne. Okay, yep. Australia somewhere. And uh, <laughs> we also have from... From Australia, James, James Burt from... G'day, everyone. <laughs> it's a little bit earlier here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we were just discussing before we started the vagaries of daylight saving and how it throws everyone out for a couple of weeks, but uh, people are slowly starting to get back in the sink, I think. Yeah. So anyway, let's um, find out where people are at. Um, Eon, I know you posted in the project bank an update. Which is great, yeah. and uh, Kavita's posted a couple of times in our Moodle discussion forum. Um, James has emailed me a couple of times, so we've had some communication. So I know that you guys have been up to something. So let's just uh, do an update. So Ian, tell us what you've been up to. Um, okay. Well, uh, it's the. This was an interesting one. It's. It's. I put it up to Project Bank, and and of course this week we're discussing. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the title of the, the section exactly off the top of my head. It's um, teaching and learning, isn't it? It's about the... Yeah, I'm learning, teaching and assessment. Yeah, that's it. Learning, teaching and assessment. And the way that I read the brief was that really this was the section where, um, as well as just talking perhaps about what we did, we looked at it from the point of view um, more from the teaching and learning side of it. Um, and so... What I tried to do with my um, my section was I just focused on one thing that I do. So I did a series of workshops called Light Bites, and I sort of deconstructed them from the point of view of the the teaching and learning and pedagogy and stuff like that. So had a go at that and um, pop some other evidences in. So that's the first section, and then the second section, which is about um, uh, understanding your uh understanding your uh, students your target learners yeah the target learners um is that uh, again you know sort of really just focused on one of the things i'd, I'd have done with light bites is um they've been going for about three years but I'm, I'm quite rigorous with the feedback and so and they're quite experimental so every week i do a feedback session and they've actually grown the sort of format has actually grown out of that so really i was focusing on learning sort of knowing about my um my students really from that feedback and then putting it back into the um the sessions that i run so that's kind of a bit um like uh participatory uh you know action research in a way or you know you have students in, in, in your case mostly lecturers um but students yeah. negotiating learning outcomes etc um so you can start to sort of bring into your reflection all that, that sort of associated theory as well yeah, around um, rhizomatic learning, um, you know, social constructivism, etc. Yeah, um, I did wonder because it, it's funny. It's it's where to pitch it because I suppose one of my dilemmas was that in in one sense I'm quite a practical chap, and although the theories and stuff obviously inform, and you know we focus on the social constructivism quite a lot with the the way that um, I go about the sessions, you know, getting people into mixed ability groups, getting them to talk, setting them an active challenge where they're doing things together and learning against each other. Um, so in that sense, you know, it, it is sort of based in that area. But I suppose really what I've done is is focus a little bit more on the how I put it together rather than sort of digging into sort of heavy duty, heavy duty pedagogic theory. And I, I don't know where where the balance is. And I'm assuming within the portfolio um it's really it's your own take so if i was very very theoretical i could build that side up 
um, but because I'm actually quite a practical teacher, I've, I've sort of focused more more on that. I don't know if that came yeah, out. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I think, uh, you know, everyone's portfolio is their own and it's their own, uh, you know, it's a reflection of their own experience and how they go about that. Um, personally, I just think that it's, it's quite useful to show that what you what you've done practically has mm. been informed by some sort of theory it's not just you know i tried this and it worked and hey i was stunned you know yeah. <laughs> it's like well i actually mm. thought it would work and that's why i did it and here's the reasons why um yeah. so i think it's useful put it to put you know at least some links to supporting theory you know what, right, what okay. have you yeah. based your your basic design decisions upon Mm, yeah. um, and, and, and it's up to you as to how deep you go with that as you say if, if that's your main sort of um, approach to teaching and learning and I guess you know that that is for me uh, is sort of the the uh, learning theory side of stuff and so my portfolio reflects that but I think if you can sort of at least weave in what yeah. your core influences are into your reflection is, is quite powerful because mm, I think uh, that's quite a good um, criticism because i you know, I've made notes, you know, also made reference to social constructivism and some of the ways that I do the activities, but that's it. What I haven't done is put in some links and references out. So what I think I'm hearing from you, Tom, there is it might be useful, even if they're quite, you know, standard stuff, really just to yeah, yeah. sort of make those connections. Yeah, that's a good idea. And, and also I think um, uh, even more powerful is if you've actually, um, you know, written about your experience, you know, you've done a conference presentation, conference paper, ah, yeah. or you've, you've done a journal article mm -hmm. about your practice to reference yeah. that. And so you're giving evidence of critical peer reflection and feedback on what you've done as well. Yeah. Um, so in a way, by doing that, you, you almost prove that your, your practice has already been peer reviewed. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. a good idea. One of the things I did put in, which, I'm, which was, I had a bit of fun with, actually, we were involved in um, creating an online course with a, a group called FutureLearn. I don't know if you guys get access to FutureLearn. Yeah. Um, and they actually used my sessions as a, as a case study. So I've actually put that into the, um, into the portfolio. So if you want yeah, to see I think me so. around and do Yeah, evidence like that is great. And it, it also shows evidence of impact of your practice yeah. beyond... You know your own your own uh, sphere and your own practice, and if it's becoming international impact, that's that's really quite powerful and cool. Can I just also say I just had a look at what you've put up there um, from the from a teacher's point of view. Um, in I I like to see that I've met my objectives or outcomes when I'm delivering oh, yes. a workshop or uh, a training session, for example. So maybe for people like us who kind of have to com compartmentalize information, maybe you could also um, list the objectives you were hoping to achieve oh, and the yes. learning outcomes. So the, sort yes. of the, the purpose of this and how you measured if you did meet those outcomes. I'm curious to know if, um, how yeah. you measure that. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should put that in. I mean, the way I measure it, they're, they're very, um, a very very informal session so the whole idea of them is it's 45 minutes bring a cup of coffee and we'll explore something together so uh, in one sense it's it's sort of getting a obje hardcore objective um, feedback on on learning is it perhaps doesn't quite fit the sessions but again as I mentioned in the feedback well there's two things that come across is that um, people do feedback anecdotally to me and in the feedback that they write that um, they have learned something and quite often we see people picking it up in sessions and using it themselves with their students which is which is pretty cool one of the things that um i've been fighting so hard to try and um bring into the sessions and it's all politics is a digital badge and so it's this idea yeah. that people in a way it's a sort of peer assessment so people will do three of these things and then what i ask them to do is can you go away and then come back to a special session and present how our light bites have influenced your work and share it with everybody and then get it peer marked by everybody there and then award them a digital badge and that that's sort of been on the cards it's just that we've we sort of hit the pit of institutional bureaucracy because they um at one minute there we were you know we could do our own badges and then we were told oh no we have to do it properly yeah. through the institution at the moment the whole lot's composting in IT services somewhere but yeah, um, yeah. when we dig it out yeah. I think um, that will be quite cool 
But again, so I think that that's part of the um, maybe one of the key differences for around a portfolio like yours and mine and and possibly Kavita's as well. We're we're actually predominantly involved in staff development and our students are lecturers. Um, Yeah. And so it's quite a different relationship because there isn't that that real, you know, there's not summative assessment. We don't have that power relationship over our students because they're not really students. Uh, And so the way we go about designing uh, uh, you know, a workshop or whatever is quite different because we, yes. we don't have to meet defined, you know, assessment criteria. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where I think this section for for a general academic is probably the easiest section to do because you've already got all those learning outcomes. You, mm. you have to have those in black and white. You know, your your outline of each lecture, what the learning outcome is you're meeting, how you're assessing it, yeah. are you assessing this part formatively or summatively, and the evidence of that. And so that's already there. And so you can just, you know, upload that as a PDF or a Word document and yeah. refer to it. But as Kavita was saying, I think it'd be really useful if you, you know, um, if you've got, got a blog or, or an outline, you know, in, in some sort of note form that you use as the guideline for your session to, to really link that. Yes. Yeah, my approach is much the same. Um, so in my role at Deakin, I'm responsible for building the capacity of the academics who use all this technology. So they're yeah. my students. I still approach them with the yeah. same um, with the same directives, and that's to get them to be able to do one thing. And so I tell them that you're going to learn to do this thing. I'm yeah. going to help you become competent at it. And how do I yeah. know that you're competent is if you've created this particular thing using these tools, for example. So I'm, yeah. you know, that's just how I work. I'm a bit more. Um, uh, sort of stringent and maybe much more methodical and mm. uh, I think in your role um, Kavita you're, you're a sort of a learning designer or kind of a role aren't you whereas perhaps Ian and I are a little bit more um, uh, fluid and around <laughs> sort of, uh, uh, creating communities of practice and, and stuff like that so it, you know it's, it's, it's how you it's your practice and how you, you reflect upon that but providing the right sort of evidence for that I think is quite yeah. critical and it's, it's, I'll just share very quickly a little story in one of my measures. Um, and again, you know, as, as with Tom, it's lecturing staff, you know, they're turning up because they want to be there. I have no, um, mm. you know, I can't make them be there or anything like that. I wouldn't want to do that, to be honest. Um, but I set the sessions up and the bit of feedback, which I get constantly all the way through, is when people leave, because I set them up as an exemplar of, of teaching. I do all sorts of things in there. Um, which they experience, which aren't necessarily part of the what they think they're coming along to do. So they might be learning Adobe Spark, but they're also um, experiencing a way of teaching, um, active learning, group activity, uh, some technical QR codes, screen mirroring, blah, 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 all this, all this sort of stuff chucked in as well. And it's all quite deliberate. But often people will leave the sessions and because they're quite friendly affairs and they'll say, do you know, Ian, I really enjoyed that. And here's the key. Mm. I'm going to steal that idea is what people say to me. And it's just sort of if I'd gone in there and been preaching, sort of go, you will use QR codes because they're good for you. You know, they'd all just tell me to, to take a walk. But because they've experienced it and actually gone, oh, this works for me. I can see how it works kind of thing. Um, then in a way, that transmission of idea is slightly different, mm. but it is still there because they're members of staff. That makes sense. Is there a way, Ian, that you can capture that information and see how many of those people actually have uh, adopted those practices inside of their classrooms? Yeah, and um, also how they've adjusted it as well. So they might yeah, have different I, interpretations of how to use it. Yeah. I'm thinking, um, I get it in the feedback, but usually at that point it's, I'm going to use this. I think what might mm. be quite interesting would be, and maybe I'll just send an email out or something and just sort of say, how are you using it? Um, and I think, yeah, that would be a really nice way of, of sort of squaring the circle, I think, because at the moment you say it's anecdotal. I know it's yeah. happening, but there isn't a, you know, I haven't got a piece of paper with it, you know, written 27 people. Went so that does week. bring me to um, one of the, a couple of the activities for this week that we've um, suggested that people look at. Um, I'm just going to pop in the screen sharing just to um, pull it up here. But, um, so by way of example of how can you perhaps get a bit of a feedback from uh, your teaching, whether that's whether you're in professional development like myself and Ian and Kavita, or whether you're a teaching academic like uh, James or 
uh, you're, you're in some sort of teaching learning support role, you know, you're looking after the online learning team or whatever, how do you get feedback from the people that you're working with? And mm. I guess one, one way we tried to sort of subtly model that this week uh, was by uh, having a, a, a survey. So yeah. we invited people to take part in the survey around the scholarship of technology enhanced learning. And I guess surreptitiously it's also hopefully trying to get people to think about what informs their practice and, Mm. And uh, so, you know, having having a very short online survey that perhaps people take at the end of each session mm. or at the end of a series uh, and, and getting feedback that way uh, might be one way to do it. Um, mm. So I guess that's kind of partly what we what we tried to model with this little survey. Mm. Um, and uh, if you haven't taken it yet, then then uh, it'd be great if you if you did. And we did one. In the first week as well, which was trying to link a bit more about theory and uh, into into practice. Uh, so that's one way to do it: just a simple poll, uh, you know. And, and and then again, this is also evidence for using technology in your teaching. You know, if you're yeah. using an online poll, uh, you're using an online survey like SurveyMonkey or you know a Google Form. Uh, you you are integrating technology into your teaching and learning practice. Um, the other activity we suggested was um, possibly getting together and collaborating on, you know, a, an actual assessment design. Mm. And this is something that I, I do quite regularly because it's the way that I work with um, um, the academics that I work with. Or, you know, I'm an academic as well, but uh, the, I'm not actually teaching students. And so what, what I'll get them to do when I'm working with them and they want to redesign an assessment or a workshop or a series of lectures, the first thing I get them to do is to share on Google Docs their current outline. Mm. You know, so it's got their learning outcomes, it's got their, uh, how they break down their sessions, it's got the assessments that they currently do. And, um, and then we can collaborate on that. Uh, um, and um, James is joining us twice. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, what's happened is my iPad has just uh, run out of juice. So, oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> so forgive me for the next second or so. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, and, and then um, you know, collaborating on curriculum design, and that way you can get new ideas that perhaps you haven't thought mm. of. Uh, and, and generally, in most cases, what I find is, is you know, curriculum design is this very solo pursuit it's a very lonely mm. one as well you know um so getting people into that mode of hey i can actually collaborate on curriculum design uh, is, is another powerful mm. tool and we just suggested that as a possible activity um and then finally of course this webinar we would knock around ideas and some great ideas coming around so those were kind of like the activities for this week and of course sharing sharing sections of your portfolio in the project bank and I did refer to earlier that Ian had shared his under week three. So um, Ian's obviously one of our starring uh, uh, participants uh, this round. There he is. Uh, I presume that's you there, Ian. <laughs> in an earlier, no, you know. it's not me. Great. It's been, it's been hugely informative and entertaining reading what you're doing, Ian. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So look, look, looking forward to Kavita sharing hers yes, as well. And, I know. Unfortunately, I, you know, I spent the two weeks um you know bedridden because i was really ill so i haven't been able to make you know these interactive videos that i planned on making and i'm a bit behind but this is this is great this is something i'm going to sort of refer to as a sample of um uh of what you're doing mm. it's, it's you know like hard. like uh your use of adobe spark yeah um, i think it's just Definitely. it's quite fresh and different and yeah um so I have actually, after, you know, because obviously we've collaborated on several of these CMOOCs already here and, and, um, uh, and, you know, after seeing what you've done on Spark, I've started sort of recommending it to some of the people I work with and mm. they just absolutely love it, you know, as an alternative to something like PowerPoint and they just sort of feel so free, like suddenly, you mean I can use something beyond PowerPoint? And uh, it, it gives you a different mindset as well. It's instead of having these distinct slides, you, everything's a bit more connected, you know, mm. uh, and more graphical as well. 
Um, I don't know. Can you see me on the video? I don't know when I'm speak or, or uh, yeah, I can see you in a small, small way. I'm going to yes. stop screen okay. sharing and, and <laughs> go back to the big view so we can see. One, we one of the really powerful things about it. So I sound, sound like a salesperson, don't I? But one <laughs> of the really powerful things about it is that it's a really cool way of putting things on a phone. And in fact, that's really mm. what it's designed for. And one of yeah, the I, mobile app is fantastic. Eh? That whole yeah. mobile thing, rather than mm -hmm. having it as a PowerPoint, it can be used as a PowerPoint alternative. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, it's putting it on the phones, and I think that's a real that's a real game changer because yes. suddenly it means you can run sessions and rather than have you know being the sage on the stage with your PowerPoint, mm -hmm. you know, la la la, whatever you can you know you can almost just put a QR code up. Everybody's got their stuff on their phone and then you know what you're in there doing the doing the active learning and i have to say i, I find it really really powerful for that and it's easy I'll just have to to, i was just going to say ian uh what was very interesting is i'd never heard of adobe spark before i think it was our first session and mm. i'd just gotten a new computer and just downloaded the adobe creative suite and i noticed it there and went straight in and started looking at like how to create for it and do it and it's very easy and then boy it's wonderful especially in being able to produce content for mobile phones so yeah. so with my students being uh, undergraduate students predominantly their capacity then to be able to engage with their phones during uh, lecture time which often people will uh, look down upon and the institution mm -hmm. will frown upon um, yeah. in this way they're able to at least use devices that they're uh, familiar with and that they use almost you know 24 7 and yeah. in that way it certainly connects with them so here's the uh, evidence that you need that i am now adopting adobe spark as part of my teaching practice <laughs> i will be recording this and putting it in <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah i'm next definitely <laughs> yeah so i think that's 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 great um james you know from mm. from a teacher perspective um and I've certainly seen that from from several of the people that I've, I've been working mm. with in paramedicine and um, uh, a couple of the health disciplines that they've they've yeah suddenly seen a change in their students' uh, engagement uh, mm. when they've moved from PowerPoint to Adobe Spark. Oh, and yeah, a big part right. of that is instead mm. of you know up, up the front telling students to turn their phones off because they're not going to anyway, they're just going to do it under the desk. Yeah. Yep. Suddenly they're actually using the tool in an educational way you know, exactly. and they're, they're using that to engage uh, which yeah. is fantastic yeah um, so yeah great points awesome so um yeah it, it's, it's was there anything else that you wanted to talk about Kavita? i mean um be interested to find out about how you about this little video series that you're talking about and, and yeah. how you're going to bring that into your portfolio Yes, so you know, uh, I was out of action for a couple of weeks, so I'm just sort of coming around to finishing week one, really. Um, I've set up my WordPress website, and I've also now, it's just now sort of clicked in what the purpose of the project bank is, the blog, the discussion forum. So I suppose um, I'm expected to to sort of share everything on my on my website, correct? On my WordPress site, and then elements of it in each uh, project bank week post. Is that yeah, I mean, that's what we're encouraging. You don't have to, but we're trying to encourage open educational practice. Yeah. Um, and and uh, that, that's the way that you get feedback from other people and you can you know, have, a, have a global impact. Um, if people know what you're doing, then yeah. they're going to go, wow, that, that's cool. Let's, let's invite Kavita over to Coventry and get her involved because she's doing this really cool stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that certainly worked for me, you know. So I, I, I was working with um, Helen Keegan uh, yeah. from Salford University online and uh, doing some online projects. And then she got a job at Coventry and then all of a sudden got, a, got an email, you know, saying, you know, come over here and run some of your workshops here. You know, and, you know got to meet Ian. Uh, you know, and, and by having that open practice, that I just opened all those doors. Yeah. So that's the benefit. So uh, you know, if you if you're locking everything you're doing away, then that's never going to happen. No, 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 that's not my approach either. Um, so I think my focus and my contribution to to this sort of this series of uh, this course would be using technology, using feedback in technology. So encouraging. Um, 
the academics that I work with to focus more on providing feedback in the creation of the tools and the objects. So at Deakin, we use H5P. I don't know if anybody else is familiar with that authoring tool. It's a, it's a silly name, isn't it? H5P, but it's a series of tools that Sounds you like can use. Kind of yeah, it does, doesn't it? Sounds a bit too right. ticky. Barbecue sauce. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, so I had never heard of it until, you know, a few months ago when I started this job. But this is the only tool that we're using to yeah. conduct learning checks for, mm. on our online courses and blended learning sites. So I've become rather proficient in it. And I want to see now how the academics incorporate feedback into the creation of these tools. I'm currently mm. training some mm. of them. So what I might do is also video that session so you so you know you can have a better idea of what that means, what it looks like, and then the outcome. So what they've created and how they're using it. And then maybe long term we can see if that was of any benefit to the students who are then using the tools. Um, to their course. So it'd be mm -hmm. nice to, to follow that. I like to I like to see if what I'm doing is actually of any use. Yeah, so that, I mean that's one of the things that I've I've done over the years as well, Kavita, is uh, pretty much um, recorded, you know, just about every project I've been involved in. No, not the entire thing, but just the key snippets of it and, and generally either using a webcam or my smartphone camera mm. and uh, then just popped it onto my YouTube channel. And so if you look at my YouTube channel, there's like hundreds of videos, but they're all little snapshots of various projects mm. and it's a way of sharing those, but also okay. recording them so I can come back on and reflect on it later. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. So I obviously similar, you, need, oh, you need to I get say I do a similar thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was so just going to say, that. I do a very similar thing in your yeah. right, Tom. You have to get permission. Otherwise, no. the institution yeah. will uh, frown down upon you putting uh, what would be considered institutional material online. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough, too. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's more about the reflections, uh, you know, that's a, it becomes a great record. And it's something that's much more... I don't know, it's just, uh, you can tell a story through those um, mm. easier than just text, you know, and photos. Um, and it's, it's just a bit more, you know, source material and dynamic. Um, so often if I'm doing a presentation at a conference, I'll play one of those, those video clips that, that illustrates what I'm talking about. Um, and it's just quite powerful. Plus, you know, so I do the same thing here with the, with the webinars. These are recorded and then mm. I upload them to a YouTube playlist. So um, people can watch them later. So yeah, my mum's a regular viewer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't. Resist that. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like the uh, you know get your fe thesis um, printed and you know people who buy uh, your mum and your dad. Okay. I wonder if Netflix is interested in purchasing this webinar series. Oh, a million dollars in episode, <laughs> <laughs> or Apple TV maybe. Apple TV Plus, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they they seem to be struggling for content. <laughs> hey, well, it's been great to chat, and it's been really nice to sort of knock out some ideas, and uh, it's been great to see how things are still lining up for people, yeah. and really looking forward to uh, to seeing what Kavita's going to share. And I know James will eventually; he's just a bit um, flat out at this point. Oh. I had intensives la, la, oh, this week. This week I had intensives. So I was teaching all the construction students on how XR visualization can assist in their construction practice. So it's interesting when you're a, a technical person, you get adopted across every single discipline in the institution to talk about your research, i.e. XR in education, and then how you then connect that with all of their discipline activities. And uh, so it, it's, a, an, it's an exciting, but very time consuming process. <laughs> All good material for your portfolio, James. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, well, thanks everyone. I'm gonna uh, close down the session now. And it's been great having my guests, Ian, Kavita and James. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Cheers, mate. Bye. See ya.